Episode 77. Why is Poplar so popular? Or maybe I should ask, why isn't Poplar so popular? Um, it does seem like opinions are divided. Some people absolutely love Poplar. Some people absolutely hate Poplar. Although I suppose there's some people in the middle who are just kind of like, yeah, great secondary wood, but maybe not as a primary wood. But the thing is, Poplar can be found just about anywhere because it's so incredibly plentiful. But the pop you're using, is it actually popular? Excuse me, is it actually poplar? I'm going to do that like 30 times in this episode and guarantee you say popular instead of poplar. Poplar could be any number of species and it may depend heavily on where you are. So in short, this episode is going to talk about my favorite and everybody's favorite secondary wood. Maybe it could be more of a primary wood, but let's take care of some business. Um, thank you. Uh, Bunch of new patrons joined uh, the show this week. Thank you so much for your continued sponsorship there. Uh, as always, if you are interested in supporting the show, patreon.com slash lumber update. And I got a whole bunch of questions. In fact, I've been mapping out the next couple of shows and just trying to find places to put in all these questions. So thank you, everybody, for keeping those questions coming. If you do have questions for the show, you can email me at lumberupdate at gmail.com. Of course, you can also go to lumberupdate.com, and there's a, a, a contact form there as well that drops things into a database that I check periodically too. And I've been getting uh, questions via Instagram. The at lumber update is the uh, handle there as well. So thanks everybody for sending your questions. Keep them coming. Love to see it. I continually get questions that I would have never thought of before. Um, things that maybe I take for granted that other people are like, what the heck does this mean? So definitely keep that coming, folks. Um, uh, living and, and working in the lumber industry all day long does kind of mean that sometimes things that I think are obvious or sometimes I think are, quote, common knowledge are definitely not. So I love seeing these questions from you all. So let's talk a little bit about some industry news. I had an interesting article come across my desk uh, this week about... Some scientists at MIT who are growing wood in a lab, but specifically, and you know, obviously that's not a big deal, right? We grow, I grow wood in, in my backyard, you know, <laughs> silviculturists grow wood everywhere. Um, you could probably transfer that to growing in a lab, maybe in a hydroponic setup. But what's different here is these scientists are growing these trees in a specific form. So to greatly oversimplify this article, they're growing a table. They're growing a chair. And we've talked about this where you can train um, a tree to grow in a certain shape. And I know on Wood Talk before, we've talked about guys who have grown uh, actual chairs by teasing and training vines in order to, to grow in a chair shape. This is like 3D printing wood that I've talked about in the past on this show. But now we're not 3D printing anymore. We're actually growing it um, in a particular mold, in a particular shape. Very, very interesting stuff. Um, obviously, we're a long way off from, from you know, mass production or, or overall application here, but it kind of blends 3D printing with actual growing of, of the, um, the plant the cell. Um, very, very interesting stuff. So I'm going to place an article or place a link to that article um, worth checking out. It's a, it's a pretty long article and it gets in a lot of technical detail, which uh, I dug. I loved it. Uh, basically, 3D bioprinting techniques is what this is all about. Cool, cool stuff. Next, um, there is, there's been a, an act that uh, the Biden administration has been looking at for uh, the, called the Build America Act. And it's another one of those, let's try to keep things on shore as much as possible, increase manufacturing and things like that. So the Biden administration, uh, man, I'm trying to say April of this year, 2022, um, they updated the guidance uh, um, on what particular sourcing requirements are required. And specifically, when it comes to government buildings, it will also be made in America. But what's interesting is the plywood lobbies, the um, 
all the people, the, the agencies and industry interest groups around plywood are saying we need to include hardwood plywood in this as well. And it's currently under consideration, which if it does pass, it could be particularly interesting because um, the Decorative Hardwood Association that is, has been really pushing a lot of this is saying that veneer should also be considered a construction material, as is uh, plywood. Um, if that's the case, just about every single government building would have to be, any wood in it would have to be 100% government made. Um, and that is not happening right now um, because the plywood is being sourced from far flung places in Asia in many instances. So that could be, I don't know, it's hard to say. I go, I, I, I'm, I'm kind of off and on in this whole Made of America thing. I certainly want to see it. I'd love to see more onshore um, and, and more, um, like I talked about with the Russian plywood shortage. Wouldn't it be great to see somebody step up to the plate and create a good shop grade panel here in North America, or at least in Europe somewhere. But it's really hard to say because, you know, sometimes there is a place in the market for the cheap stuff. There is a time and a place when it makes sense to use the cheap stuff. And I often wonder, can the cheap stuff actually be made in North America? And if so, what corners have to be cut to get there? So I don't know, I'm up in the air, but it is a particularly interesting um, industry update that uh, I'm gonna kind of pay attention to because if this petition does go through, instead of it just being the stud material, it's going to be all the hardwoods and all of the heart, all the veneer products as well, which is pretty much all the wood that you can think of would have to be made and manufactured. Not, that's the key thing, manufactured in America, not sourced in America, but manufactured in America. Big, big difference there. So be curious to see where we go on, um, on that whole thing, that whole thing, as they say. Um, so let's get kind of into our main segment. This was spurred on by Jonathan. Um, but also, frankly, I love poplar. Um, I use it all the time as a secondary wood, but I've also built many pieces of furniture using just poplar. Poplar is a fantastic paint grade wood. Um, and we say paint grade because a lot of times it means is, you know it's not very aesthetically pleasing. And a lot of people will say poplar is kind of meh. Um, I kind of like the look of it. But more importantly, the grain structure takes paint really, really well. Uh, it goes on nice and evenly. Likewise, you can dye poplar really evenly as well and not get a whole lot of blotchy nature to it. And dye is really paint, if you think about it. It's just a more dilute, less opaque version of paint. Although depending upon the, how strong you mix your dye, it can be completely opaque. So I've built um, several pieces of furniture, actually in the room I'm sitting right now as I'm recording this, that have been, uh, one has a black base back black milk painted base and the top is a kind of a dark reddish walnut type color that's poplar and it's been dyed using transient dye i've got another piece over here that looks very much like cherry and it's actually poplar actually there's a third piece there's a picture frame on the wall over there that was poplar and that actually from this distance looks a lot like walnut so, you know, it, it, it's really a, a very versatile species. It's soft and easy to work with. And uh, it is found everywhere in North America. But really, it's kind of found all over the world. It's just a question of what poplar is your poplar. <clears throat> so Jonathan says, I've, Jonathan says, I've been meaning to ask you about poplar for the longest time. Um, I feel like you've mentioned it many times in recent episodes, but it's high time poplar gets its own episode. All right. So here's the question. What actually is poplar? Is tulip poplar equal to tulip wood? Is yellow poplar equal to tulip poplar? And in particular, I'm in Maryland just as you. Um, and what specific species of poplar are our beautiful tall poplar trees with yellow orange flowers that seem to drop sap all over your car if you park underneath one? I can get this stuff in beautiful, long, clear stock, super cheap from my local sawmill, and aim to start experimenting with it in some uh, boat applications. Jonathan then goes on to say, my question about poplar is largely related to its cross-grain strength and rot resistance. When I try to do research, 
meaning Googling and reading through boat building forums, there always seems to be someone piping up that the current available stock of Poplar is, quote, different from how Poplar used to be and useless for boat building. In particular, someone will say the cross grain strength is terrible because Poplars we have growing now everywhere now are a different hybrid species introduced by the government in the 50s or some sort of crazy conspiracy theory sounding mess. But when they say this, they say it's not as strong as older growth Poplar used to be. Now concerning rot resistance, like most trees, the sapwood tends to have terrible resistance, but the heartwood is reported to be good. How do you tell the difference between sapwood and heartwood for poplar? I've seen poplar logs nearly three feet in diameter and all of the wood is white. Is there no heartwood? When you see the beautiful streaking, the greens and browns and those amazing purples, is that sap or is it heartwood? So um, good question, Jonathan. There's, there's a, a lot to ruminate out on there and I'm sure there's a lot of people who may be wondering, poplar for boat building? Say what? Well, here's the thing. Here's the wonderful thing about poplar is it actually does have a pretty strong rot resistance. Now it's important to clarify what rot resistance really means. Just about all trees are resistant to water or will do fine with water. If you think about it, a tree is hydroscopic. Um, one might even say hydrophilic when you look at how you know you stick a board into a puddle of water and how the capillaries will suck the water up into it. It's not the water that causes a, a tree to rot. Rot is caused by pests, by insects, termites, carpenter ants, all kinds of fungus and things like that. Actually, those aren't insects, but you get the point. A board's resistance to boring insects and 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 fungi is what means what makes it a good exterior wood or slated only for interior purposes. So you look at the prime examples of exterior woods. A lot of them are rainforest trees. Well, there's a whole bunch of insects in the rainforest, and the trees know this. <laughs> the trees have evolved over millennia, eons to have a high amount of resin and a strong and a high amount of oil, high amount of extractives that taste terrible to the bugs, so the bugs leave them alone. Add to that to the fact that the trees themselves are very, very hard and a lot of work for some of those boring insects or for fungus and things like that to actually get a hold of and to, to, to um, grow within. That's what makes those rainforest trees so incredibly rot resistant. Well, poplar is actually quite rot resistant. Termites don't like it very much. If you've ever seen uh, something that would be called rainbow poplar, where there's lots of grays and purples and greens, all of that is extractives in the wood. All of that is resin. All of that is stuff that termites don't like. So it actually is quite rot resistant. I think the bad rap it gets is because it's quite soft as well. Um, the poplar that, that I am familiar with on the East Coast has a hardness of about 510 janka. So yeah, you know, it's less than half the hardness of, of hard maple, you know, less than half that of, of white oak and red oak. Um, but it is still considered to be rot resistant. And the cross grain strength is also one of the things that poplar is known for. One of the reasons that poplar has long been a furniture wood is it makes great panels, wider panels for casework and things like that, because it's not as easy to snap a board across the grain. So like, you know, you go to the karate studio and you see the guy, you know, breaking boards and we look at it and go, yeah, well, he's breaking it across the grain. Anybody can do that. Well, a lot of times they're pine boards, throw a poplar board in there and it becomes substantially harder to do this. And you can go into your own shop, grab a 12 inch wide pine board and grab a 12 inch wide poplar board. You could still break them across, you know, um, along the grain um, over your knee, but you'll find that the poplar board is substantially harder. Moreover, do this with a poplar board and something like a maple board, and you will be surprised at the very little difference to snap a poplar board than it is a maple board. Now you may find the maple board a little bit harder um, to snap over your knee, but not substantially. And when you consider maple has a hardness of about 1450 as compared to the 510 of poplar, that's impressive. So yeah, just the way the tree is structured, it actually has pretty good cross grain strength. But let's talk about botanical names. Let's talk about what, let's kind of address Jonathan's questions. You know, in, in Maryland, where he is and I am, what exactly is poplar? I can walk out in my neighborhood and probably one in three trees is a poplar tree. Um, huge, huge trees, super, super tall. In fact, it's one of the tallest hardwoods in North America. Um, they, that is what you would colloquially call the yellow poplar. 
Uh, Lariadendon tulipifera is the botanical Latin name. And what's interesting is it's Lariadendron. The genus is Lariadendron, which is actually closer to Magnolia than it is to the populous genus where most of the poplars come from. Really, all of the poplars are in the populous genus, which is where that name poplar comes from. But the populous genus is um, cottonwoods and aspen. Um, black poplar, balsam poplar, white poplar, basically anything that has poplar in the name except yellow poplar is in the populous genus. All of the cottonwoods and all of the aspens also fall into the populous genus, and they are all very, very similar. Like we can expect black walnut and butternut to be very much the same, or utile and sapili to be very much the same because they are in the same genus, you can expect all of the populous genus woods to be very similar. Here's the thing. Even though yellow poplar is in the magnolia family, it's in the Loriodendron genus, it itself is also quite similar to the populous genus. So it probably kind of makes sense. Someone probably long ago misidentified it and just said, oh yeah, that looks like, you know, white poplar, or maybe not white poplar, it looks like black poplar. White poplar goes in Europe, by the way. So if somebody was standing on the East Coast of North America looking at a yellow poplar and thinking that looks like white poplar, he probably just got off a boat from Europe. Um, you know what, now I'm doubting myself. Yes, yeah, white poplar is uh, Southern Europe and all the way over to South, uh, Southern Asia. I, sometimes there's too many species running around my head, folks, and I get them mixed up. <laughs> But it's possible that somebody looked at a yellow poplar tree, a uh, Loriodendron tulip vera, and said that looks a lot like eastern cottonwood, which is in the populous genus, so we're going to call it poplar. And it is of a more yellowish cast than white poplar or black poplar uh, or balsam poplar. So I'm pretty sure that's where it came from. I haven't obviously done the research to figure it out. But technically, no, it is not a true poplar. It's more of a magnolia. Um, and for that matter, I have a magnolia tree in my backyard and I've pruned it a couple times and made spoons out of it. And I will say the magnolia also works very similar to the uh, yellow poplar trees. Now, the other thing that poplar colloquially is known, yellow poplar is, is called is um, tulip wood or tulip poplar. And that again goes back to the whole idea, Loriodendron tulipifera is its botanical name. So again, hey, it's a poplar. No, it's not really a poplar, but it's a tulipifera species. So let's call it tulip poplar. You know, it's kind of a branch of both things. Again, this is all marketing, folks. The one thing that I think is is unfortunate is when people call it tulip wood, because there is a species called tulip wood that comes from Brazil. Lovely, lovely wood, pink and yellow and cream and hard as a freaking rock. Uh, I want to say about 2,600 Jenka, um, super, super interlocked, um, practically waterproof. It's what you would expect of a tree to come out of the Brazilian rainforest. Um, makes lovely pens. <laughs> I say that because it's very difficult to get blanks much larger than a pen blank, at best maybe a peppermill blank. But that's tulip wood, and that doesn't look at all like what people who are calling yellow poplar tulip wood. So if you're going to call it any colloquial name, call it tulip poplar, don't call it tulip wood. Not the same. The other thing about tulip wood is it's a CITES listed species. So we definitely want to, don't want to be encouraging people to go, you know, buy a whole bunch of tulip wood because if they end up with the actual Brazilian stuff, it's going to be super expensive and it's an endangered, well, it's not an endangered species. It's a CITES 2 species, which means it's in danger of becoming endangered, which means let's leave it alone. So the rainbow poplar, as I said earlier, is also a yellow poplar. It's just yellow poplar with a lot of mineral staining um, that's reacting with those extractives, those things the termites don't like. It's reacting with it to create those purples and grays and things like that. Essentially, rainbow poplar is a marketing name, very much like ambrosia maple or beetle kill pine. You know, ambrosia maple is it's a, mostly a soft maple, although you will find some hard maples with fungus, with mineral staining in it. Beetle kill pine is a, a, it's a, several varieties of pine, but it's got um, excretions from beetles that have stained it. Um, it's the same wood. Rainbow poplar is yellow poplar, just with a whole lot more, a um, whole lot more color in it. And if you look at a lot of, um, you find like a really wide yellow poplar board, you know, we're talking 24, 30 inch wide, very common to find these, but a lot of times the center of that board is gonna have a lot of dark colors, dark olives, purples, dark grays, that came out, obviously being a wide board, it came out of a very, very mature tree, a very old tree. 
And the older it gets, the more essentially tree waste is packed into that heartwood center. And the more time there can be to react with the soil for things to react with those various extractives in the wood to create that kind of staining effect that comes from an older growth tree. Now the, the stance that you know, it's not as strong as old growth poplar. I think you could say that with just about any species. Although the interesting thing about a lot of hardwoods is the older they are, they tend to be more brash, more brittle because hardwoods, as we know, by definition have pores. So when you look at the ring porous or even the semi ring porous hardwoods that have their pores closely grouped together. Well, when you've got an old growth wood with tightly packed growth rings, we look at that and go, wow, look at all those growth rings. There are more instances of those large pores all grouped together. And again, I, I call, I think of a ring porous wood as an old dot matrix printer paper with those perforated little things on the side that you had to put it onto the, onto the little wheels to advance it on the printer. Those perforations, you tore them off and you had your piece of paper. Well, that ring porous, um, arrangement is very much the same way. Those are the perforations within the wood. So you can imagine the closer packed together those growth rings are, the more perforations you have, therefore the more brittle it can be. So really old growth red oak is actually not nearly as strong as faster growing, quote, newer growth red oak um, that has more of that denser material between the, the growth rings, because the, the, the growth rings are wider spaced. So the growth ring starts with a bunch of pores grouped together, and then there's the denser material in the late growth after that. But there's a wider area of that. I'm just gesticulating madly here, guys. You have to be able to see my hand motions to see all this. So it is one of those misconceptions <clears throat> where old growth hardwoods are automatically stronger. They're not always. Now, in diffuse porous woods, you could make a case for this since the pores are more evenly distributed and more often than not, diffuse porous woods have very small pores. Poplar, yellow poplar, and actually all of the woods in the populous genus are diffuse porous woods and they have pretty small pores. So yes, you could say that old growth yellow poplar, hell, any cottonwood or anything in the populous genus, old growth is going to be stronger. Is it going to be dramatically different? Is it some sort of hybrid species? I've never heard a government conspiracy on that. It's still the same species. The yellow poplar from 300 years ago is the same yellow poplar that we're using today. Is it growing faster today? Are the growth rings spread further apart? Maybe they are. Yeah, absolutely they are because they're getting more sunlight because the forests are, have been thinned. The trees that we see, I went on a hike the other day and I passed several 300 foot tall poplar trees those probably grew in my lifetime. So, you know, since the 70s, they've been growing. Certainly things have been thinned out. They don't have old growth forests. So yes, I suppose one could say that is not as strong, but the inherent stronger cross grain property that, that is yellow poplar is still there. You can take a, a new growth, quote, new growth yellow poplar tree and do that test I talked about or break it over your knee with a, a new growth maple tree and you're going to see, see the same experience. It's a proportional thing. Does that mean that you can't use it in boat building anymore? I don't think so. Um, the thing with poplar, and it's interesting, I was trying to find the Woodwright Shop episode. I remember, I think Roy was carving a dough bowl. Um, I need to go back. It's in like the earlier seasons, like maybe before season 15. And he's talking about poplar. And you know how Roy is. He can tend to wax poetic. Um, and he was talking about how how much poplar was used during the colonial period and then, you know, after uh, the U.S. became a country. And it began to outdistance Europe because, A, we had so much forest over here, but we also had so much poplar. And we were exporting a lot of poplar to Great Britain specifically, but also into continental Europe. And the British kept thinking, we got to get some of this stuff. You know, they have um, some poplar. I'm trying to think what you would find in the UK. I think what they would be looking at would either be white poplar <clears throat> or possibly the European aspen is also in the populous genus. That would have been their version of it. But Roy made a joke that um, yellow poplar, the stuff that I have on the East Coast, and frankly, yellow poplar extends 
pretty much into the Midwest. Yellow poplar can be found even in, you know, Kansas, Nebraska, um, it's a little bit in the eastern part of the Rockies, but there's not a whole lot of trees in the eastern part of, of Colorado. Um, it's widespread, in other words, but it is everywhere in the Appalachian region and in the Midwest region. But our mountains run north to south. You know, the Rockies, the Appalachians, they all run north to south. Roy said the mountains run the wrong way in the UK. Um, generally, they're kind of in these clumps that run kind of sort of east to west. One could make a case against that. But the mountains prevented the water runoff and the soil chemistry that was needed to allow yellow poplar to grow, and it never really caught on. So over here in America, we were building a nation, quoting Roy, paraphrasing Roy, we were building a nation around this yellow poplar species that could be used for pattern making because it was great to carve, being nice and soft. It was being used for chairs. Again, great species for Windsor chair seats, carved seats. It was being used in automobiles. Studebaker was one of the largest users of poplar, the, the car maker. Um, and you can imagine a lot of other people in Detroit were using it the same thing. The railroad was using poplar left and right. Great cabinet wood, relatively lightweight. Great big, big deal. When aerospace took off, poplar was being used heavily. Poplar was being used in manufacturing as a disposable um, uh, where you would have uh, steel mills and manufacturing plants that needed um, a disposable surface that they could roll out steel on or they could roll, not so much steel, but other metals and things like that. Steel was mostly used hard maple, um, but they used this as rolling mats and in, uh, was specifically designed to have to be replaced every month or so. Dunnage um, in, in transport and logistics, crates, pallets, everything as, as America went through its industrial boom. And even into post-World War II, the atomic age, just the, forgive the expression, the explosion of growth, poplar was behind a lot of it. And it has always been an inexpensive wood. It's always been a fast-growing, easily replenishable wood, a lightweight wood, a relatively a hard wood considering it's lightweight. Obviously, it's a soft wood compared to things like walnut, cherry, and especially oak and maple. But still, when you compare the density and the lightweight nature of poplar, you have to compare it against softwoods and spruces and things like that that have a hardness of around 300. Yellow poplar being 500 ended up being quite durable. That rot resistance I talked about earlier became a huge benefit when we started talking about exterior cladding, um, clabbered siding and things like that. Poplar was being used for all of this. It was building a country and a country was thriving on this particular species. B because the British, their mountains ran the wrong way, they couldn't get it to, to, to hold on. For that matter, you could make the same case in a lot of continental Europe where it just wasn't grabbing. Whether the Mediterranean climate of Southern Europe couldn't handle it, the Northern climate couldn't handle it, it just didn't grab on anywhere else. It is very much a distinctly North American species. But let's talk about some of the other species of poplar that, that we run. Actually, you know what? I, I kind of brushed over this, but let's let's talk about yellow poplar, um, Liriadendron tulip vera. It is probably the hardest of the poplars, whether it be the populus genus or in the Liriadendron genus. Yellow poplar at 510 is the hardest of all these species. The populus genus tends to be around 300 to 450 on the Janka hardness scale. All of these, whether it be Liriadendron or populus Gina genre are diffuse porous, which means they take paint really well, but they also take dye really well. No pore filling required for this. The lower density of these also provides a fair amount of tooth for a pigment like paint. So in a lot of times when you've got a, like a really, really hard kind of slippery wood like hard maple, a lot of times people will say, well, scuff sand the surface to give the paint a little bit of tooth. Poplar, due to its lower density, one might say somewhat spongier nature because it is quite a bit softer, it already takes it and it actually doesn't really require priming in order for paint to take it on. The harder woods, you need to prime it for paint to take it. Um, so that's one of the things that like the number one reason I sell poplar today and I sell a lot of poplar is because it's used for painted moldings. Um, fantastic for that. The density is around 0.5 to 0.4 to 0.5, depending on its moisture content, which again, that low density allows for all these nice things like 
easier workability, lower softness, great taking paint, but also lightweight. As a really lightweight wood, it's a great furniture cabinet wood. You can build large panels and not have super, super heavy pieces uh, of, of you know cabinetry. You can use it in um, wainscoting and siding and paneling, um, solid wood format, and not have it be super heavy. You can use it for millwork, specifically interior moldings. Try hanging like a, a hard maple crown molding that's 15 feet long. That thing is super heavy. Poplar is going to be half the weight quite a bit easier to hang that. Also, because it takes paint so well and so many moldings are painted today. Let's just think about it, folks. The design idiom that is today is painted interiors. We're starting to see natural woods come back, but not so much in linear molding. We're seeing it as accent pieces, maybe an accent wall, or maybe an accent cabinet, or maybe a kitchen cabinet with a, with a natural wood finish. But the linear moldings, your crown, your base, your casement, most often tends to be painted. Certainly there are architectural styles where it's, it lends to uh, you know, a stain grade or something like that. But I would go out on a limb and say probably 75% of the linear millwork in this country is painted. And it's probably poplar. If it's not some sort of plastic, it's probably poplar. The other thing about poplar, yellow poplar um, specifically, it has a heavy use in plywood. Just about all of the hardwood plywood manufactured in North America has a yellow poplar core. If it doesn't, it has an aspen core, which if you remember, is in the populous genus, very, very similar to poplar. Now the aspen's, aspen's gonna be about 300 hardness, but frankly, when we're talking about plywood, hardness is not really that big of a deal because it's it's mostly about the glue. You know, the, the, the plies are so thin, um, you want a, a, a softer, lower density ply so that you can keep the weight down on a panel. But that's a, a major, major aspect of, of poplar in, in manufacturing is this engineered plywood material. A lot of this could be said in other parts of the world where plywood, hardwood plywoods made in other parts of the world could be using um, some of the white poplars or white poplar? Yes, the white poplars, um, black poplar, um, could be used because black poplar grows across Europe as well as Africa and in Asia. Let, let's actually talk about that. White poplar is Southern Europe, Mediterranean region, but also a little bit, a little bit north of the Mediterranean region, all the way across into Asia, Southern Asia, even Southeast Asia. You will find it to some extent. Balsam poplar, very cool, kind of looks like yellow poplar with a lot of mineral staining. To me, it reminds me more of a uh, like a birch, uh, like a silver birch. Um, balsam poplar is particularly interesting, a little bit more variegated color. That's gonna grow across the Northern US and Canada. Um, really Northern US, mostly Canada. Yellow poplar, as I've talked about, Eastern US, but definitely all the way to the Mississippi, even touching a little bit into the Rockies from North to South, it's found everywhere. Um, Black poplar is a European species, grows across Europe, grows through Northern Africa and a lot of parts of Asia, even up into Northern Asia as you start to approach the boreal forests. Black cottonwood is in the populous genus, but that's found primarily in the Pacific Northwest up into Canada as well. Eastern cottonwood, that mingles with yellow poplar. Um, it grows all across the Eastern US and it spreads heavily into the Central US. So as the yellow poplar begins to thin as you move west across the U.S., the black, um, excuse me, the eastern cottonwood starts to get a little bit heavier on the ground there. Quaking aspen, that's what we see when in the Rockies, you know, all the golden leaves fluttering in the fall. That's why it's called quaking aspen. That's all across the Rockies. And then European aspen, um, that grows across a lot of Europe, but grouped more in the temperate areas of Europe. Now, there are a bunch of others. There's other types of aspen. I think there's a few other um, more regionally specific cottonwoods as well. <clears throat> not dramatically different and also not quite as widespread that, that you probably, if you come across them, it's not going to be commercial. It's going to be because you had a tree growing in your yard. You're going to find all of these as ornamental yard trees just about anywhere in the world. Um, but from a commercial perspective, what we're seeing in North America is yellow poplar or um, eastern cottonwood, quaking aspen. Um, to some extent, black cottonwood, um, if you are buying up in the Pacific Northwest, Oregon, Washington, even into British Columbia, what you may be seeing <clears throat> is black cottonwood. 
the thing is, unlike like construction grade timber, where you go into Home Depot on the West Coast and you might see Douglas fir, you go into Home Depot in, in Louisiana and you're going to see Southern Yellow Pine. Um, you go into Home Depot in my neck of the woods and you're going to see like a hem fir, Eastern white pine. Um, that regionality, because those woods are more interchangeable, you'll, you'll see that regionality in the big box stores. If you go to Home Depot and you buy poplar, it's going to be yellow poplar almost from coast to coast. That's because yellow poplar is so incredibly plentiful. As I said, one in three trees around me is yellow poplar. And it grows um, in, in like you walk into a forest. I have a, a state park near me called Palmer State Park. And there's a trail that runs around it. It's nothing but poplar. Like you'll see the occasional um, birch tree. But that's like one in 20. And the other 19 are yellow poplars. They are everywhere. And they, they tend to grow in these mass. In other words, they do very well um, to the point where they can even dominate out other species. Um, they are relatively shade tolerant. Um, so they can pretty much grow anywhere. I would say I'd say quasi shade tolerant. Um, there are certainly other species that are going to be better about it. And in that particular forest, I was talking about those birch species. Those are the shade tolerant ones that kind of grow up in the in the shelter of the yellow poplars. But what happens is the yellow poplars kind of outcompete the other guys and they just take over. So you get these huge stands of forest that is all yellow poplar. Because the tree grows relatively fast and it grows huge, the amount of board footage that you can get out of a yellow poplar is enormous with much, 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 much less waste than a lot of the other hardwoods. The somewhat creamy color of yellow poplar, it is similar to the sapwood. So Jonathan's question was, what's the difference? The sapwood is truly going to be a very white, creamy uh, color. The heartwood is going to have more of a yellow or olive-ish, olive, olive-ish, olive cast to it. It's going to be slightly darker. But in a younger tree, you may not find that much darkening of color into the heartwood. And as Jonathan said, I've seen three-foot diameter logs that appear to be white all the way through. Well, that could be a soil chemistry thing. The soil chemistry could have been particularly bland at that point, and there hasn't really been any need for any kind of reacting with those extractives to create that darker olive cast or those dark grays and things like that. When in, in, a, in a more ideal environment, <clears throat> which may be possible in a plantation if that tree was grown specifically for lumber, you're going to find very little difference between heartwood and sapwood, which means more of the tree is going to be usable. Um, Sapwood is not a defect according to NHLA anyway, but as a lot of us know, we'll pick our wood based upon how much sap's in it because we want the heartwood. Um, poplar, because A, there's not a dramatic difference between heartwood and, soft, and sapwood, more of that wood can be used. B, because so much of poplar's use, at least in furniture and cabinetry, is as a secondary wood. Drawer boxes, things that don't be seen, things that get painted, we don't care about the appearance. And let's be fair, the aesthetics of poplar, it's not cherry. You know, cherry is beautiful. Walnut is beautiful. Poplar, I think, is beautiful in its own way. The thing I find beautiful about poplar is just the sheer size of it, the sheer quantity of it. The fact that I can go anywhere and see hundreds, thousands of enormous poplar trees with super, super straight bowls. And I look at that tree and go, man, that is like all usable lumber. There are no knots in that. It's pretty much all clear. There's a great deal of respect um, for the tree itself, but the lumber that it produces to the point where that kind of tinges my view and I find poplar to be quite beautiful. But yes, set a poplar, yellow poplar board against, you know, walnut and, and cherry, and I'm going to choose walnut and cherry every day. Heck, I would choose white oak over that. But you get the point. Much of its use is not so much for its aesthetics. It's for its, you know, size of boards, workability, you know, lengths, especially when it comes to moldings and millwork. One of the reasons it's so popular in millwork is the, the you know, average length of linear millwork, at least the orders that I fill, 15 foot long. People don't want eight foot pieces of crown. They want 15 foot pieces of crown, 20 foot pieces of crown. It's very, very common to, to you know, to, to order your millwork, your linear millwork, at least in that respect. So it is a fantastic species for all of these things. And the heartwood and satwood designation is not that big of a deal. 
If it is a big deal to you, because yes, most sapwood is going to be less rot resistant. Those resins, those extractives that don't taste good to the termites, while they exist in the sapwood, they are very dilute. Also, the sapwood is also going to be filled with the nutrients, with the sugars and things like that, that the bugs do love. So it's kind of like, you know, you've got a really, really, really bitter tasting lemonade, but at least the sapwood, somebody thought to add some sugar to that lemonade. So it's, it's bitter at its core, but it's got the sugar on top to make it that lovely lemonade. I'm reaching with that one, I know, guys. But so the sapwood may be less rot resistant if you were using it for boat building purposes. Um, and if you're uncertain, um, you can generally look at the ingrain when you've got more. Um, how, do, how should I put this? If think of it as is like using dye. You take a, a glass of water and you fill um, fill that glass. Say the glass is is six inches tall, and it's a, a you know a three inch diameter glass. You fill that glass with six inches of water and you put three or four drops of like a, a, a brown dye in it. Mix it around. As you look through the grass, the glass across its width, across that three inch diameter, the water will be a light brown color. Now, if you look down on the top of the glass through six inches of water, that water will be a very, very dark brown, if not fully opaque color, because you've got more water. You've got a taller column of water to sight through, um, and less light is getting through because there's more pigment particles in there. So while the pigmentation of a three quarter inch thick yellow poplar board may not be that dramatic from sapwood to heartwood, look at the ingrain and you know it's a three quarter inch thick board, but maybe it's six inches long, maybe it's six feet long. Now you've got a larger column of water, back to my original example, and you ought to be able to pick out the difference between the heartwood and the sapwood. It actually shouldn't be that difficult. Um, just kind of step back and look at the board, you know, from a, a, a higher altitude, if you will, and generally you can see the difference. But here's the other thing: the sapwood on a yellow poplar and most of the wood in the populus genus is not really that thick. The tree itself is quite strong, and because it's fast growing, the sapwood is depositing the waste via the medullary rays into the heartwood at a much higher rate than some of the other trees, than something like, well, walnut. Um, that has a lot of sapwood, or cherry that has a lot of sapwood, you'll find dramatically less sapwood in a yellow poplar or any of the cottonwoods that I talked about than you will on a lot of the other hardwoods, which again, makes it a fantastic wood for a lot of uses. So if you can't tell, I really like poplar. Actually, I love poplar. I use it all the time. As I said, I've built multiple pieces of furniture just using poplar. It's incredibly cheap. It can be found just about anywhere. It can be found in wide widths. It can be found in long lengths. And the idea that poplar is not as good as it used to be, I don't know if I agree with that. The tree is grows so fast and so large, it's hard to improve upon it and make it any better at, at what it does. You may be able to poke holes in it and say it's not as good as this or this or that, and maybe you're just stretching its application. You know, if I was going to build a boat using teak or poplar, yeah, I would choose teak for that. But it doesn't mean that poplar can't be used as well. And actually, Jonathan sent me a quote from a boat builder who uses nothing but poplar because he says it's still stronger than plywood. And with so many boats being built out of plywood these days, that's kind of an interesting statement. You know, for centuries, boats were built out of poplar before this manufactured plywood thing came around. And uh, when you look at the stress tests of the solid yellow poplar versus a plywood panel of the same thickness and same size, you'll find that poplar is going to exceed it. But for that matter, most hardwoods are going to exceed the strengths of plywood there. So that's my love letter to plywood. So if poplar isn't popular in your neck of the woods, maybe you need to start making it popular. Because to me, yellow poplar, any popular, whether it's in the populus genus or it's the, the weird brother in the Loriodendron genus, it should be poplar. I love poplar. So folks, go buy some hardwoods. But specifically, go buy some poplar this week. <laughs>